right, so we have cosine and so why did I scratch out these parts? So we need to pass the horizontal line test. It's always nice to have uh, the x value zero whenever you can. And we start at zero. If we go to the right, use positive numbers, we can't also go to the left or we'll fail the horizontal line test. So I have to get rid of all the negative x values. And I can go to the right for a little while until I start to go back up again. And then I have to stop right there. So we're going to restrict the domain. And this is cosine. So we're going to restrict the domain. And our notation for restricted domain, we are going to use this vertical bar and then put a uh, interval below it. And that just means restricted to 0 to pi. And of course, it's cosine of x. So this notation right here. Restrict domain to two, and we're going 0 to pi. All right. So if I write domain of, let me just write domain of cosine. Well, so this is going to be our restricted domain. Now, when we flip this function around, we invert it. This is going to be the range of cos inverse of x. So the domain of the function, original function, when you invert it, is the range of the opposite or the inverse function. And we can see right on the graph, I didn't label it, but you've graphed cosine a lot. So we're going from negative 1 to positive 1 is our range. And we're going to write that down, range of cos x. not zero, negative one to positive one. And this is the domain of cos inverse of x. So we know the domain and the range of cos inverse, and we're ready to graph it. The way we graph inverses is you're basically swapping the role of x and y. So I'm going to graph the line y equals x. It's going to look like this. So this line is the y equals x. It's a linear function, slope 1, intercept 0, or the origin. x-axis, y-axis, all we're going to do is swap them. So just think about your two axes, and you're going to make them trade places. So what happens, you, if you want to just think about basically rotating halfway across the line y equals x, or reflecting, whatever works better for you. We're just going to take this and turn it over. So we can do that very carefully. I'm going to label these three points that we're going to look at. It's the same three point. We threw away the last two in the period, but it's the same ones that we usually use, just the first three. And the coordinates are 0, 1 pi over 2, 0, and pi negative 1. So those are the three points right there, xy's. All we're going to do is turn xy's into y-axis. So we're just going to trade the order of the coordinates. So I'll graph our inverse function in blue. And I'm going to scroll down. So we're going to lose this on the board when I scroll down. And we had a 0, 1, which turns into 1, 0. So I'll say this is 1, 0. So all I'm doing is taking the 0, 1, and I'm changing the order of the coordinates. So the x, y's are changing. Zero, uh, 1, 0. We had pi over 2, 0 was our next one, which is 0, pi over 2, right here. And the last one was negative 1 pi. We'll put that right there. And now we have to connect them together. And that's a little bit tricky. So what we're going to do 
is look at the way the original graph looked. So this is not how they're connected. Obviously, that's a lazy cosine graph right there, or cosine inverse graph. So we're going to try to get the curve as nice as we can. So we're going to look at the original curve right here. And I want you to just focus on the first part of the curve. So this, when we flip it around, it's not going to look that different. When we reflect this part of the curve, it's still going to sort of bend, uh, depending on how you want to think about it, down to the right or starting at the bottom and we'll go up to the left. But the curve's going to still have that bend to it. So we're going to do our best to connect these two points together. And the curve is going to look like that right there. And now we have to finish this curve right here. And from here, it should be sort of obvious. It looks, it's going to go like that. So we just graphed. This is, I already used f of x for our function above. So this is g of x cos inverse x. So that's our graph right here. Now I'm not going to put this in a box and tell you to memorize it. There's other things I'm going to have you memorize, but I'm not going to ask you to graph the inverse function. But you should definitely know what it looks like. What I strongly recommend you remember is where it came from. So you can hopefully graph cosine by now, and you just have to make sure it's one to one. So you can decide exactly the parts we throw away. You can sketch cosine graph in hopefully about three or four seconds and scratch out the parts that make it not one to one. And generally you're going to start at zero and then go the best way after that. So you should never want to go negative if you don't have to. So we go positive. So what type of questions can I ask? We can ask somewhere. Let's do some example questions. Uh, and another thing are any trig function is going to eat angles and give us either sides or ratios of sides. I'm just going to write sides in here. Sometimes it's opposite over adjacent or a fraction of one side or divided by another side. But trig functions go from angles to sides. So inverse trig goes from sides back to angles. And that's an important thing to remember. So any trig inverse functions are going to go from sides back to angles, which is going to seem a little strange at first. So we're going to find cosine inverse. Let's start with something easy. Let's do 1 half. So if we look at the graph, where is 1 half? Remember, it's an x value here. So 1 half is going to be right here. And I want to know what y value is sitting right there. So you may have some intuition about cosine uh, in inverse of 1 half, what that angle will be. I'll give you a hint. It's really close to pi over 2. So the, way, the best way to think about the way inverse functions are related to regular functions, I wrote it up top in yesterday's lecture, right here. So this is the best way to think algebraically about how functions are related to their inverses. You can move the function to the other side using the inverse function. So we're going to use this idea right here. And have I used a triple equal sign yet in this class? All right, so I'll really quickly explain it one more time. I should tell you why I'm using it. So it compares equation to equation. And let me show you why a regular equal sign would be really bad at that. I don't think I explained why, that's, why I can't use a regular equal sign. So if I want to compare equations, So do these two equations tell you the same thing? They both tell you x is 4. What happens if I put a regular equal sign here? And we read, what does this tell you? 
x equals 1. It can't be 1 and 4. I mean, separately, before I did the equal sign in the middle, these two equations told me x is 4. So I can't just say they're the same with an equal sign. So I'm using the triple equal sign to say, hey, they're telling me the same thing. You've been doing this a whole lot uh, in your algebra career. You just generally wrote them one above the next, above the next, like this. So you didn't actually, you never put any marking in between to say these are the same thing. You just wrote them next to each other, and you knew it was the same x, so they meant the same thing. So you used uh, juxtaposition or just positioning to denote the equations are the same or equivalent. So that's why I have to use triple equal sign. I try to make it a little bigger, bolder, so it's more obvious that it's not just an equal sign. So now we're going to use that notation along with the idea of inverse trig functions are going to give me angles. So I'm going to let theta equal cos inverse 1 half. You don't have to use theta, but I like to use theta every time that I know I'm using an angle. And so I know cos inverse is supposed to output or give me an angle, so that's why I'm saying let theta equal. I could do this with any letter I want, but I think theta is the best one to use because I know it's an angle here. And now we're going to flip this around. So this is the same as, I'm going to move the cosine function to the left side. So theta equals cos inverse of 1 half is the same as cos theta equals 1 half. So I move the function to the opposite side with the inverse. Now, what theta value has a, or what theta has a cosine of 1 half? There's lots of answers. What's one of them? Five or three works. What's another one? So it's even, so negative pi over three also works. Five pi over three is another one. And you can keep going positive, keep going negative. So how do I know which one to choose? Well, I know it's this one, but why is it that one? there is something we have to be careful about. So if we look right here, range cos inverse is, we said somewhere 0 to pi. So that means cosine inverse can only output 0 to pi. Can't output negatives, can't output anything past pi. So that narrows it down to exactly one value. So all the negatives are out, and everything bigger than pi is out. So that has to be positive pi over 3. So theta originally was cosine inverse of this stuff. So theta, before even knowing the angle, I knew theta had to be between 0 and pi. Couldn't be outside of there. And that's how I picked pi over 3. It'll generally be the first one that pops in your mind. So these are out right here because theta had to be between 0 and pi. All right, so we got pi over 3. So that was our first example. Let's do the next one. So I want to find cos inverse. Let's do negative 1 over square root 2. So we're going to do the same first step, and this is a different, different theta here. So we're going to let this theta equal cos inverse negative 1 over square root 2. And so we're going to write the equivalent equation on the right side. And remember, theta has to be in the range of cos inverse, which is still 0 to pi. All right, write the equivalent equation with regular cosine and then decide what theta needs to be. And there's only one correct answer. 
because of the restriction of where theta comes from. So there's negative 1 over square root 2. Remember, cosine is an x value. So if you're thinking of unit circle, that's a very valid way to think about this. There's two answers, but only one answer is between 0 and pi. So we're going to go with the 3 pi over 4. So any questions on this right here? Flipping it around, narrowing it down. Do one more example. So what is wrong with this cos inverse? Yep, so we're outside of the values that cos inverse can input. So the domain of cos inverse, negative 1 to 1. We're too big. So this is uh, undefined right here because negative 2 is not in the domain of cos inverse. Domain is negative 1 to 1. This is too big. Well, I, sh I should say too, negative too big. So we'll go with one more algebraic property of inverses. So if you go f inverse and then f, they cancel each other out. So it's like doing nothing. So you get back x. And if you go the other way, f inverse of f of x, they also cancel out to give you x. So if you do one function and then undo it, do the opposite, you better get back to where you started. So if we look back up at the FF inverse right here. So if you start at x and then you F it, you get over to some y value, and then you F inverse, you better get back to x over here. So you better get back to where you started. Same thing if I started over here and did F inverse first, and then F after that, I better get back where I started. So either way, you should get back to where you start, depending on which way you go. Algebraically, it looks just like this. You have to be a little careful. You just have to make sure when x is in domain f inverse. And over here, you have to look and be careful when x is in domain of f. So it's not for every single x, but as long as the uh, inside function is allowed to eat x, it'll be OK. So for example, you couldn't 
so you couldn't feed negative 2 to cos inverse. So that it wouldn't cancel out like this. So of course this works with cosine. So if I write cosine of cos inverse x equals x, what is the restriction? This doesn't work for all x's. So this works when x is in domain of cos inverse. which is negative 1 to 1. So that will cancel out when x is between negative 1 and 1. And likewise, the other way around, cos inverse of cos x equals x. This one, this is when x is in domain cos x. But we have to be careful. This is the restricted domain because we're talking about cosine inverse. So this is when we're between 0 and pi, not all real numbers. So these are specifically important for us. Um, this is, I'll write down a side note for notation. You can write it just function notation. So composing functions use a small circle and they will cancel out to be this function and this is the identity function. The identity function so this function of x is always going to equal x. So this is a function that doesn't do anything. And likewise, f inverse of f reduces to the identity function also. It's supposed to look like a bold one. That looks like a shed. There, that's better. So the two functions cancel out, and you don't need to use that notation right there. Some books uh, just write ID. That works too. So this gets into the idea of uh, category theory, where you look at functions, not their inputs. You look at just pure function properties, which you won't do unless you major in math, and you probably still won't do until grad school at some point. So we don't need to worry about that right now. It's just something neat to think about. All right, let's do an uh, example right here with these properties. So let's find cos of cos inverse of one third. So one third, that's some weird sides. We haven't looked at cos anything with a third in it at all. We've seen some square root 3 over 2, but not 1 over 3. All right, but we're only going to use the properties above here. So I'm looking at the property on the left. So is our input between negative 1 and 1? Sure is. So the cosine cancels the inverse cosine, and we get 1 third. And that is because 1 third is in the interval negative 1 to 1. So it's in the correct interval, so the cosine cos inverse cancels. So our next example. We'll do seven pi over three. All right, is seven. So we're looking on the left now because regular cosine it eats first is 7 pi over 3 between 0 and pi. Nope. So I can tell you what it's not going to be. It's not going to be 7 pi over 3. It's not going to cancel out like that. So there are a few ways to do this type of problem. Let's think about 7 pi over 3 right here. 
So I want to find theta with this property. So my theta needs to be between 0 and pi. such that cos theta is cos 7 pi over 3. So I want a theta in quadrant 1 or 2 that has the same cosine value as 7 pi over 3. So I like to use unit circle a lot. So we'll go right to that. So you could use periodic property. 7 pi over 3, that's full 6 pi over 3, and then some more. So we do a full lap, and then another, so that's 6 pi over 3, also known as 2 pi, and then another pi over 3 after that. So the reference angle will be pi over 3. Either way, we're talking about the same uh, point on the unit circle right there, whether we go 7 pi over 3 or just single pi over 3. So cos pi over 3 equals cos 7 pi over 3. This one I could have done with just the periodic property right here. You just basically take out a period of 2 pi. Uh, you can't always do it that way. We'll do one example after this that you can't just do it that way. All right, so we all agree cos pi over 3 equals cos 7 pi over 3. So I'm going to make a substitution now. So let me erase. We know it's not 7 pi over 3, so I'm going to take that out. So what I underlined, I'm going to substitute out. With cos pi over 3. We said they're the same exact value. So I'm just substituting that out. Now, I can cancel cos inverse and cosine because pi over 3 is between 0 and pi. So they cancel out, and we just get pi over 3 like that. This will be our last example with uh, cos inverse of cos. So before we get started, is negative 2 an angle or a ratio of sides? And how do you know? It appears to be some sides. Why is it an angle? What is the input for cosine always? It's always angles. So we're feeding cosine the angle negative 2. Now where in the world is negative 2? That's a little bit tricky. So we're going to have to think about where is the angle negative 2. Certainly, and we're always in radians unless I write degrees somewhere. So it's not negative 2 degrees. Uh, so certainly, it is not going to equal negative 2, because negative 2 is somewhere not between 0 and pi. So it's negative, so it's not between 0 and pi. So they will cancel out when we get the right number here. So how in the world do we get the right number? We're going to go right back to the unit circle. So first of all, we're going negative. So we're going to go clockwise. Now we're measuring in numbers here, no pies. So usually, we're going to count in pies. So pi is approximately 3.14. Uh, oops, negative. We're going to go negative, which is negative 3.14. Here's negative pi over 2, which is approximately I want to say 1.57 something. Yeah, that looks pretty close. So where is negative 2? What quadrant? It's in quadrant 3. So it's 
a little closer to negative 1.57 than it is to 3.14. So we'll just draw it right about here. So our x value is cos of negative 2. I don't care about the y value. If I was using a sine function, I would care about the y value. I only want to think about x value. So we're going to do the same, same game we did before. Somewhere I want an angle. So we need a theta between 0 and pi such that, which is approximately 0 to 3.1 four such that cos theta equals cos negative two. How in the world am I going to get this theta? So what quadrant will theta have to be in? It's either one or two. Which of those is theta going to be in? So cosines x values. So here's the x value. I'm marked on the x-axis. So what I need is the point up here on the unit circle and then the angle to get there. And I'll do the rest of this in blue. That's the angle I want right there. How do I figure out what angle that is? So I want to go, instead of going negative 2, I want to go positive 2 in this case. So up here, theta is going to equal 2. And we'll go the positive direction. And it'll have the same, so this one will be cos regular 2. We could actually go with just the even property of cosine on this one. So there's our theta equals 2. So we got cosine of 2 equals cosine of negative 2. So 2 is between 0 and pi. It's in quadrant 2. So cosine cancels, or cos, yeah, cos, cos inverse are going to cancel out. And we're just going to get two right there. So these are some of the more tricky questions I can ask on your midterm or quiz. Because you have to think quite a bit in different ways. So you think algebraically, you may have to think about the unit circle. Uh, we haven't had to use reference angles, but we're going to do the same problem with sine. We're going to do a sine inverse of sine of negative 2, and you will have to use reference angles on that one. So it'll look really similar, except we're going to think about y values matching. So it should be obvious if we were looking at y values, the matching y value would have been right there. So I would have thought, ah, that's the y value I want, so I skip over to quadrant 1, or quadrant 4, and then that's a little bit harder to measure. So we'll deal with that one uh, when we do sine inverse. Oh, because uh, I had to measure in a negative way, so I wanted to keep everything negative right there. Uh, just marking off, uh, measuring in the way the angle is going, basically. All right, so that was all cosine. We're going to go for sine inverse now. So we're going to begin with a graph. Uh, sine, so f of x equals sine x. All right, so graph out sine. Do one period.
So you always want to use, so we're going to make this one-to-one, -one, so we're going to restrict domain to make sine x one-to-one. -one. So we need to make sure we pass a horizontal line test. All right, we want to start at zero whenever we can, and we're going to go to the right. How far can I go to the right before I fail to be one-to-one? -one? I'll fail before I hit pi. So what's the furthest I can go to the right before I fail to be one-to-one? -one? So pi over two. As soon as we hit the top of the hill, we can't go down, or we're not going to have one-to-oneness right there. So we're getting rid of all this stuff out here. So that's all gone. So let's draw some more sign, uh, another period on the left, or at least a half a period. I don't think I can squeeze a full period in here, but we'll go and get a half period. How far can I go to the left before I fail to be one to one? So I can go to negative pi over two. If I go any further, I start going up, and then I fail one to one right there. So I need to get rid of all that stuff up there. So we're going from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. And you always want to try to take zero. And the general rule is at least take zero and use the positive side. Sometimes you have to go negative also. So restricting domain. So restricting to negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2 of x. So this is the function that we're inverting. So domain of this restricted sign is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And this is the range of sine inverse of x. So original domain is range of the inverse. And we do the same thing with the range sine x is negative 1 to 1. And that is domain sine inverse x. So we have a similar negative 1 to 1, but the original domain is very different. It goes negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we're going to do the same graph that we did before. And we got 0, 0 here in the middle. Pi over 2, 1. Negative pi over 2, negative 1. So we're going to take those three points and change the order of the coordinates. The good news is 0, 0 doesn't move. It goes to 0, 0. And then we'll just graph the other two. And we're going to reflect across the line y equals x, which will so the we're going to reflect across this line that I just drew in right there. So that's the y equals x line. So 0, 0, it's easy to graph. And now we're going to go 1 pi over 2. So 1 to the right, pi over 2 up. and negative 1, negative pi over 2. So now we have to decide how to connect them. And that's why I drew the y equals x line above. That'll tell us how the curve looks. So up here, the curve is basically going to flip like this right here. So I just sketched in 
the curve is going to sort of look like a start of a parabola. So it's going to bend upwards. It's not going to look like the original sign looks sort of like the beginning of a square root function. So this one's going to look more like a uh, x squared function. So it's going to bend like that. And then the other part is going to bend down like that. So I'm not going to spend so long on sine inverse because it has very similar properties and it works a very similar way to cos inverse. Uh, I will write down the way sine and sine inverse cancel. So we're going to get these cancellations with this sign and the inverse, but we have to be careful and make sure that the inside function is allowed to eat the input. So what is sine inverse, uh, sine inverse domain? So for this first one, sine inverse domain is negative 1 to 1. So this is when x is between negative 1 and 1. And on the right side, sine can't eat every x if it's going to be the inverse function. So this has to go between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we're just making sure the inside function is allowed to have the x as the input. And those are the two intervals we need to look at. So I could ask you easy questions. Like this. Why does this cancel out to negative 1? So what, am I looking at the left sine sine inverse or the right sine inverse sine for this one? I'm looking on the right side. So it's a little tricky to see here. We can approximate this interval with negative 1.57, positive 1.57. So that's pi over 2 and pi over 2 approximated right there. So it's definitely inside that interval. If I would have chosen negative 2, that would have been no good. That's out. All right, so that one was pretty straightforward. And now we'll do the tricky one. So we're going to play the exact same game we played above. So I need a theta. This theta needs to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Such that sine theta equals sine negative 2. So I chose negative 2 because we already saw where it's going to graph or where it's going to be on the unit circle approximately. We said right about there. So there's a negative 2 angle right there. So it's past uh, negative 5 or 2. So I want y values now. So I don't care about the x value, but the y value is sine of negative 2. So y value, I get the same y value right there. So the same y value across the y axis right there. How in the world do I get the angle I'm about to draw?
So this one is more tricky. Here's theta. So I'm going to draw another angle to help us out. What is this blue angle I just drew? This second angle here. Should be negative two. It's the same angle, same amount. So what is theta plus negative two? Negative pi. So now I'm going to solve for theta. It's easy to do. Theta equals 2 minus pi. So this one is a little more tricky. There were some problems way, way back in maybe the first three sections that dealt with reference angles that were tricky like this. So this will come back to those ideas sometimes. So we have sine negative 2 is sine of 2 minus pi. And now I can go and make that swap. Now it's a little tricky to see why 2 minus pi is between uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. But if our graph is correct, it certainly should be uh, in quadrant one, quadrant four. So we can look and use numbers if you want. If you use two minus three point one four, you'll get some small negative value that's less than uh, closer to zero. So this is two minus pi. That's probably the hardest type of question I could ask you from this section. That requires quite a bit of knowledge about reference angles and inverse functions.